tell you that as I thought about giving this talk, I uh, thought that it would be very important to keep to two things, one being brief and one being a little bit fun because I think most of you came here for a symposium on uh, survivorship and suddenly you're being thrown a, a biologic uh, talk. So I thought, well, how am I going to do that? And I started with my title slide and I put down a version of the words of my grant application. And as you can see, this is neither brief nor fun. <laughs> so I thought a little bit more. I thought, I need a new talk. talk. I need a title slide. So this is what I came up with. Part of sorting through the trash, which I think uh, is actually a much better description of the project. And I'm going to try to convince you in my few minutes uh, why this is uh, both a little bit fun and important to do. So this beautiful young lady is going to remind me by her feisty spirit uh, to say to you that I feel that we together are all engaged daily on a uh, battle against cancer as a clinician, as a researcher, as a parent, as a child, we are really engaged in fighting something. And I don't know much about warfare or battle, but I do know the basic premise of know your enemy is a, a very important one. So I'm going to start in the first two minutes of just talking to you how we learn a little bit more about cancer and tumor in different ways. <coughs> so, uh, the analogy I'm going to give you is a little bit silly, but it's actually something I use in reality when I talk to families about how we understand uh, cancer and how to treat it. So this picture um, is an example of how in our day and age we uh, learn about things. So just say you wanted to know something about, well, me, and you wanted to say, well, where did she come from? You might go to our favorite source of Google, and, and I would tell you that right here is what where my home is. And by looking at this picture, you can see a few things. Number one, I don't live in LA. It's not a lot of being here. I live in uh, the Northeast, and it's very urban, not suburban. And I happen to have a, a nice college in the backyard that gives us some woods. So when we uh, start looking at a child with cancer, we do sort of uh, some aerial views of our own, which I think of as our radiologic imaging. And by doing that, I can say that, well, I can tell you something about the neighborhood. There's some normal organs here, but there's something that clearly doesn't belong here, and uh, there's something clearly that doesn't belong up in the lungs. So this gives us an idea of where the cancer is located and in what parts of the body, and that's truly very helpful information in how we plan to treat. So say you wanted to know a little bit more about, again, me. You might walk down my street and see that uh, this house says something probably about me. Again, I don't live in LA. I live in a garrison colonial, and you might begin to suspect that I had children. <laughs> oh, I meant to warn if anyone was slightly squeamish, this is the most squeamish picture of the whole talk. Um, but when we start to look at a tumor, we take it out and look at it, and we um, <coughs> see that there is uh, preservation of normal tissue, the kidney that it comes from, and then the presence of the tumor and what parts of uh, the normal kidney that are replaced and what's are invaded are also very important to us to know how we're going to treat this. If you are nosy and you open my door, which is rarely locked, you might walk through and see a few things in my house. And uh, the surface of the refrigerator, I always think, tells a lot about people. Once again, you suspect their children, and you're beginning to understand that I'm not a very good housekeeper. <laughs> When we uh, look at a tumor, we go to another level, which is called the histopathology and histochemistry. We put it under the microscope, and uh, this is a Wilms tumor, and it tells us a number of things that we learn that the tumor is made up of a number of different cell types. Um, it's classically triphasic with an epithelial component, a blastemal component, and a stromal component. And we can learn uh, from this, first of all, what type of tumor is, and then it can start to tell us things uh, because actually a lot of these components look a lot like a normal kidney. So it brings up the idea that there's a relationship between tumorogenesis, the making of a tumor, and organogenesis, the making of an organ, and likely that there's a biologic pathway that is similar for those things, but can get disrupted and you end up instead of normal kidney with a tumor. So even Snoop here, you might open my refrigerator and you would say, well, they really like maple syrup, makes everything go down better. Patrick is a mainstay, and somebody really needs to go to the store to get more milk. When we snoop inside uh, 
the cells of a tumor at a molecular level, we can really learn a lot of details. And for Wilms tumor, you might think about chromosome 11 and chromosome 16, that we've already learned that there are a number of things there that can give us information about how these tumors are uh, different than the normal kidney tissue. And then, another way to learn about what goes on in my house might be to go out to the rubbish bin. And you can say, well, they buy in bulk, they drink a lot of coffee, and there's some other caffeinated sodas there. And if you actually looked in the trash, not the recycling, you would see an awful lot of Kraft macaroni and cheese and dino shaped chicken fingers. <laughs> <laughs> this is the rubbish bin that I'm going to talk to you about for kidney tumors, um, which is a uh, well known urine sample. Uh, in which I have been using a specialized technique of proteomic profiling to learn more about what comes out of a tumor. When you think about it, urine is a great source to investigate. It's very readily available. It doesn't involve any uh, needle pokes to get to. Uh, people are usually quite willing to give it to you. It's copious. And um, in the way that we are what we eat, we are what our bodies produce, and a lot of things come out in urine that are very informative. A little uh, high-spirited guy. Going to segue to our next talk. I'm going to tell you more about the technique of what uh, we're using to look at those urine samples, that rubbish bin. So, uh, high accuracy mass spectrometry proteomics is a big title, uh, but it's putting together a combination of a uh, use of a mass spectroscopy, to, which is an instrument that can look at different um, sizes of proteins and it's combined with some new advanced software technology to identify in urine samples the proteins that are being excreted. So it's giving an unprecedented level of sensitivity and accuracy and the software helps to identify uh, peptide sequences against a known human protein database which will tell us what is in that urine sample. Uh, there are uh, thousands of proteins in every urine sample, so you need the software to sort of filter out what's going on. And it turns out that although the, you would think that there's a lot of things, uh, urogenital meaning to do with the kidneys and the bladder that would be in the urine, there are a lot of things that you wouldn't really expect to find in there, so that's a lot of places in the body. And for example, uh, this technique has been used to identify some disease-associated proteins such as one identified with appendicitis that is being moved to clinical practice to help make a diagnosis of acute appendicitis. So this is how um, the process actually works, but I won't spend much time on, but we take uh, either fresh or uh, more typically stored urine samples that are frozen and spin them down in different ways, uh, filter them through different gels, make precipitates, and then uh, separate them on gels, and then run them through this mass spectroscopy and get printouts that look like this that I wouldn't want to send, uh, spend a lot of time uh, analyzing, but we have good software programs that then can turn these graphs into um, useful uh, maps of proteins that are found in the particular urine samples. And what the software does is create something called heat maps, which very basically the blue areas are things that don't show up and the uh, relative intensities of the pinks and whites are markers that uh, are found in the different. And these, uh, and the pink up the top here, oops, you can see me, that's much easier. The pink up the top is all different types of kidney tumors compared to patients who are healthy controls or those who came to the emergency room with abdominal pain. And the writing that you can't read over here shows that all these things, the most commonly found things, are <coughs> things to do with, your, with kidney injury, which is not unexpected in having a, a tumor there. So, this young lady has a very interesting story with the three Super Bowl rings, but I'll move ahead to my next phase of my story instead, which is uh, the first part of my project. So the hypothesis for this is that renal tumors of different histology types will have distinct ER proteomic profiles. And for this, uh, I obtained samples from a, uh, uh, the National Lumps Tumor Renal Tumor Bank, which is a great resource. Uh, most children who have been uh, treated for Wilms tumor or other renal tumors in this country have been part of these studies and things that they have given include yard samples at diagnosis and these are all stored in a large uh, tumor bank which with the right application you can get permission to use. So I was able to use a number of these samples and I did, we looked at samples of patients with favorable histology and rapid root tumors, clear cell sarcomas and renal cell uh, sarcoma, uh, carcinoma, sorry, and compared them 
again, to healthy controls and patients with abdominal pain. Uh, it showed that there are a lot of proteins that are unique to the patients with, uh, that are healthy, unique to patients with tumor, and then there are some overlapping. So the ones we were most interested were the ones that are <coughs> just in the tumors. And uh, this is a, a busy slide, but uh, kind of a, a visual impression is what I want you to see. So these are patients with rhabdoid tumor, and what we found was that we could pull out a group of proteins that seem to be expressed only in rhabdoid tumors. Likewise, for CCSK, uh, proteins are expressed only in that type of tumor. You know, cell carcinoma, same thing, and Wilms tumor, same thing. So we began to say that maybe you could use this to tell the difference between different types of tumors. And specifically, just looking at the Wilms tumor, so every one of these proteins has a name, and just to tell you about a few interesting ones that we're going to look into further, so prominent is a marker of cancer stem cells, so something that may have a real role in the tumor development. Um, the ciliary neutrotrophic factor receptor is a cytokine receptor, which may, uh, again, have something to do with the growth of these tumors. <coughs> and, <coughs> I'm sorry, the paradoxin is uh, something associated with apoptosis or cell death, and again, could potentially be part of an important <coughs> regulatory uh, pathway for tumors. So, how could we use this information? Well, if you could uh, look at the grouping of the particular profile for type of tumor at the time of diagnosis. It could help and aid in the initial diagnosis, especially for those patients with large unresectable tumors. So uh, instead of biopsying, if you had a marker in the urine that told you what type of tumor, that would be potentially very helpful. Uh, there's certainly the potential to use this for monitoring of residual disease. Um, along the way, during therapy, if something was still present, you might think of altering or intensifying therapy. And then, uh, as we learned uh, from Daryl last night, the traditional chemotherapy we use is not nice and not kind for patients, and that the move towards the look for the direction of biological interventions is, uh, will come through identifying potential molecular therapeutic targets. This, of course, requires validation on a larger sample group. So this lovely lady will move me in to talk about the hypothesis number two, the project that we're working on, is to compare urine samples um, that were taken at diagnosis from patients we have reference on to find out that they eventually do or eventually do not relapse. And the hypothesis is that you might see differences in those initial urine proteomic profiles. So again, using the National Wilms Tumor, 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 Tumor Renal Bank, took patients that had cured favorable histology Wilms Tumor and patients that eventually were found to have relapsed tumor. And for those patients, we were able to pull out a subset that had matched diagnosis and relapse samples, which I hope will be important. So we've already showed you some of the uh, markers, the slides before showed you markers that are in the cure rooms to our patients. And then we pulled out a whole number of patient, uh, uh, proteins that seem to be uniquely expressed in the relapse homes to our patients. And just to point out a couple, this DAPR2 is uh, something associated with kidney development, which again certainly could be important. Defender against cell death is one of my favorite named ones, and it also inhibits apoptosis. Could be associated with chemotherapy resistance. And prohibitin is another one associated with apoptosis and proliferation. So applicability for these, again, prognostic significance, if you saw these markers up front in your tumors, then you might uh, be able to identify higher risk disease and have therapeutic differences in the beginning. This could prevent monitoring of recurrence disease. Um, and then once again, open avenues of further investigation into the real biology of these tumors and allow us to look for potential therapeutic targets. Of course, this requires a larger validation of a larger sample group, and also we want to compare these to the samples that we have matched at diagnosis and relapse. So, two more beautiful kids. And my uh, last slide of conclusions are that although our cure rates for Wilms tumor are overall high, the treatment for anaplastic Wilms, relapse Wilms, and other high risk renal tumors is unacceptably ineffective, and there's a need to find different treatments. Um, our initial treatment for stratification is based largely on tumor weight and staging and things that um, are not sensitive enough and we would be much better to have biologic markers to help us with that. And then monitoring for disease recurrence at this time is limited to imaging, which is likely not all that helpful in identifying early relapses of our patients. So I do believe that the discovery-based urine proteinomics has exciting potential for the use to identify <coughs> the new urine tumor markers for improved therapy stratification, monitoring of residual disease, and national therapeutic targeting.
another character that uh, is an inspiration to me. This is to thank the people that are working on this project with me, most notably Alex Kansas is in the lab along with Melissa Burns. Most of the others are members of the Renal uh, Children's Oncology Group Renal Tumor Committee, so you've had input into this. I have to put up my own crew because they are an inspiration to me. Um, I am lucky to have healthy kids and um, they teach me something. I cannot understand what it's like to be a parent with a child with cancer, but I can understand the unconditional and infinite love that a parent has for a child and it uh, makes me understand how much we need to do better in treating children. And this slide is to thank with uh, the deepest gratitude the motivation for uh, this whole foundation. Uh, Pablo himself, his wonderful parents, Joanne and Jeff, who I think show us that they have been able to move before, beyond what must be the grief and anger associated with the loss of their child and to uh, take the energy of their unconditional and infinite love of their child to do something truly wonderful. And uh, to thank also all the people of the scientific committee who chose my work and particularly Leo and Megan for helping with all this organization. So, and especially thank you for having a job.